I'm really, I'm really happy to have you here. I think for anyone who um, has had me uh, uh, talk about you, uh, you know, over over the last little while, would know that I am a fan of your work and have always used the phrase that you are the most uh, hard working person I know in this um, genre that we have found ourselves in terms of organizing events and trying to make uh, create a creative platform for other people to uh, express themselves creatively. Uh, to that end, I have been interested to know how you have uh, been able to carry on as uh, most of the work that you have uh, established yourself in has been uh, dramatically impacted by all that's happened in the last, what, 10 months or so. Um, so I just want to get a sense of how you have been able to evolve what you do vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the world. Yeah, there's been, uh, it's, it was quite an adjustment to me. At first, everything kind of got canceled and uh, I wasn't sure how to proceed. Um, I wasn't I, entirely comfortable at the beginning uh, making a hosting Zoom calls myself um, and wasn't sure yet. Um, and I actually still haven't, although I've um, moved forward in other areas. This thing kind of came set up. The, for, I'd already advertised and set up uh, the uh, second outer, no, the uh, the third Outer Haven uh, poetry reading series that I was doing at um, at Little London Cafe in Brampton, and I already had uh, most of the poets set up for that. Um, so with that one, I still wanted to honor those um, promises to any degree I could. Yeah. Um, and I came, and I eventually came to um, asking the poets to contribute a reading that I could release as a sort of video or a short film. I mean, I've been doing things like that with readings that have been done live, but hadn't done them in a kind of tailored um, atmosphere for recording specifically only for that purpose without the sort of um, live element. Um, and that's sort of how that has progressed. So I've done a few more iterations of that video series through it. So um, that's one way, but the, that, that's a way that we've adapted, but it, the, the COVID um, effect has definitely been a loss um you know studio 89 isn't doing the um uh isn't doing the open mics right now uh, while they're dealing with their own um, issues um obviously with the pandemic um and a lot of the other events things that i was supposed to do either as poet laureate for the city um like canada day things like that um were, were taken off so that was very um that was unfortunate and also just this kind of domino effect as um you know, city uh, officials and other organizers are dealing with their own issues, with their own uh, jobs being affected, um, family members, things like that. Um, they may not have the time to put into those sort of extra um, activities as well. Um, so, no, it's just certainly been a loss. There's been some ways to manage, but uh, uh, you can't, you can be positive, but you can't deny the reality that definitely is a, is a bit of a loss. Wow. Um, yeah. Just the last way you phrased uh, your sentiments about being positive, but also being uh, steeped in the reality of what's going on. But so, um, just a quick follow-up question there. You 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 started the Outer Haven Poetry Broadcast uh, around June. Um, um, yeah. If, if I remember correctly, what would you say, yeah. regardless of all of the craziness and how you've had to adjust, what would you say? Um, were the challenges of getting over and adapting to that platform and um, more importantly what has uh, moving your work online what has it done for you what what are the positives that you found one of the um, challenges was uh, for me adapting as as host um, adding the ability to edit and do other takes of uh, segments <laughs> uh, was really it, it sounded great um, until I really had to do it, and then I realized that my um, you know perfectionism of it was going to lead me to doing like you know twenty takes of each segment, um, always nitpicking over each one, having the ability to um, having the ability to uh, kind of a trap, uh, and I'm and I'm still working on my kind of uh, kind of you know TV uh, manner of voice. So one of the challenges was definitely adapting to doing um, being that host and having that. Um, TV kind of uh, friendly uh, manner for hosting um, in a way where I was really scrutinizing myself. Um, so that's a negative. On the other hand, it has led to a lot of learning because uh, scrutinizing and reflecting and trying to improve upon has led to, um, you know, I think it's led to certain changes that I've seen. Um, 
one of the positives, though, and this is something that extends to a lot of the online events, not just the one that I'm doing, okay. uh, is that is that it's broken down phys- the physical border, the geographical border for events. Yep. So now, I mean, I did one of the on, um, Toronto Poetry Slam, we organized an open mic uh, a couple a little while ago I did, and there were people from everywhere. <laughs> somebody was logging in from like Australia at 7 a.m. At their time, yep. somebody from the States was bringing their perspective, particularly with everything going on in the country there, uh, West Coast, East Coast. Um, I've been doing a lot of readings uh, with a... Um, group in BC called the Guantlin Poetry Project, and they've been wonderful to meet. Um, so I, that's something that it's really broken down some of the regionalism um, that, that we've had. And I'm finding these other groups and poets in other places that I'm, I, I'm really liking. Awesome. Awesome. No, I, I think you just uh, um, re, uh, re-echoed the sentiments of a lot of people who have spoken to who do similar type of work. There's just been a, uh, a, uh, an outburst of your ability to reach more people um, that you wouldn't necessarily have walk into any of the events that uh, you'd be hosting, let's say two years ago or something like that. So that's something. And again, another follow-up question is that when eventually we do get back to some certain kind of normalcy, do you see online performance finding a place in your overall strategy of how you conduct what you do? For me, I, I think it'll happen in a lot of places. I think it'll happen for me as well. Um, so, for example, uh, if you know video technology allowed, I could invite somebody from you know BC to do a, a, to contribute a video or a reading um, for an event in you know uh, in Mississauga. If again, if I had the right AV technology. But in addition, I always have been posting uh, kind of summary videos of some of the uh, open mics that I'd run yeah. um, after the event. True. I could always now possibly include. Um, segments or videos from people abroad that I've connected with or networked with. And there may still be some um, times where we resort to doing only online stuff. So I think you're not going to have so many things being canceled due to like uh, weather, um, <laughs> yeah. to, like dark snowstorms, because I've driven and, and, and gone to readings in, in, in unbelievable kind of conditions. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think now people will be able to do that. And also I think it, it opens things up permanently um, to people who have, who have dealt with um, physical limitations, disabilities, mobility issues. Um, it's, it's one thing to, for a lot of people to immediately decry um, the restrictions of lockdown and COVID and the things that we've lost, but um, this existence, you know, being isolated, being uh, restricted in, in many ways has already been the um, reality for many people. Yeah deal with you know uh, chronic pain or um other, other issues whatever um it's not new for other people uh and these people have, and people who've dealt with those issues have been uh excluded uh due to um probably lack of uh using the technology to kind of open up equitable lines of communication um so i think we're still we're going to be able to see people who may not have been able to uh, uh get out to events maybe start performing um, because now uh, they'll be able to do so despite um, even if they can't leave the house or if there is, you know, pain flare up or whatever. Awesome. No, fantastic points that you've raised, uh, things that I had not necessarily thought about, but uh, uh, accessibility as well, you've just touched on, which is uh, fantastic. I hadn't necessarily thought about it in the way that you presented it. So, um, it's amazing that even in the midst of so much chaos and pain, um, you know, there are opportunities for for uh, discussions to be open and how to proceed with regards to arts and how people can, you know, have even more access to it. So uh, I'm really excited about what, what the future holds. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I absolutely am. And I uh, know it's going to have a lot of possibilities going forward. And um, I think we're, we're, we're being forced to kind of innovate in a certain way because of the circumstances yeah. and, um, and, and that that forced um, innovation. Yeah. It's going to probably, gonna, it's going to keep with us, um, you know, for a long time. And I think, yeah, there, there's, there are other th- I mean, there, I think there's a lot of things in terms of attitudes and whatnot that'll continue on um, because of um, such a seismic, kind of generational influencing of everybody, no matter where you are. Um, this is going to 
you know, have longer effects on the present um, generation as well. I often think of the way that um, people often refer to the, the generation that grew up through the Great Depression and kind of attributed all their quirks and eccentricities kind of back to that. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, you know, grandma keeps um, all the money in the mattress and she doesn't trust banks and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh-huh. And she saves everything uh-huh. and reuses everything. And grandpa builds his own tools because they were depression uh, kids. But I think that'll, you know, affect us when we're in our 60s and 70s. They'll be like, oh, no, grandpa's washing his hands for the fifth time today. Don't worry, he was a COVID kid. Um, so, uh, no, I think it'll have it'll have effects on people going forward, particularly the generation or that's uh, at their formative era, you know, like kids who, like my, I, I'm teaching grade nine this year. Okay. And, you know, I have students who are like beginning high school in this circumstance and everybody else kind of had had the old way and then moved into this, but they're just in this new way and that's it. Yeah. So next year, if, if we get back to, if we get back to some, let's say for argument's sake, we get back to some normality in September, uh, you know, these students who have been gone through all of grade nine will now get into that for the very first time in, in, uh, in, in next fall, which will be interesting for them. Mm-hmm. No, very, very insightful. You know, again, that's why I love talking to you. Very insightful takes that you have on, on certain things. Thank you. I just want to go back a little bit because I've been trying to talk to you on a... Uh, on a lot of things, but uh, I know there's time restrictions for what we have today, but I want to talk to you about your process. I know you do a lot of writing on paper, um, as is evident on your social media. Um, I want to find out how you have stalked to that medium for, for this long, and uh, what does that do for the process, for your creative process, writing on paper? Um. The writing on paper, it kind of forces me into multiple steps that then force me to edit uh, more and, and probably more thoroughly okay. um, because the process of transferring from notebook to um, computer is the kind of like an editing process in itself. Um, so that act of retyping is almost a safety net because it's kind of like, all right, anything can go wrong in this notebook because okay. it's all going to have a second look and a revision. So it allows that to be more of a mad kind of laboratory. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I got, I, I don't, it's a force of habits, really. Um, I started writing in those notebooks, specifically even that brand, um, probably in 2013 when somebody had given me one of them for a uh, birthday. Okay. And, uh, and I, and I discovered across those, um, Sharpie pens I really like, and I've just been kept buying that brand of notebook and been writing in that for everything I've done. Um, I'm not sure, I think it's also the portability and the, um, I'm not worried about, charge or technology or um or things like that uh and i don't know this is it's a certain organic um touch that i really enjoy you know it's kind of like um the difference between you know like a piano and a synthesizer with a, a, a keyboard with a, with a microchip inside mm-hmm. um but of course the old synthesizers weren't quite like that they were more analog but yeah it's more like that you have more of a it's more of a personal touch when you see the handwriting um also, I, I got a lot of trouble as a kid for having that bad handwriting. Um, so uh, I often, uh, having that now, the way it looks in the notebook, the kind of artistry of it is a bit of a way of, of ownership, I suppose. Um, but yes, yeah, so that, that's the why I write on paper and have always been writing on paper. And as I, as I move it in, to the, then move it into the computer. Um, yeah, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. It's just kind of how it naturally evolved. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I just, it's, I like the portability and yeah, I like the organic feel. No, no, uh, brilliant, brilliantly said. Um, so I want to talk about some of your works. I know that you're heavy into uh, a fantasy, mythical type of genre, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, for, for most of the stuff that you do. So I have been privileged to read um, um, uh, one of your short uh, collection of short stories got uh, damned avalon which uh, yes, <laughs> which, yes. uh, which I was privileged to read but uh, you have gone on to write even more short uh, stories and fiction and stuff so if you want to tell us um, what it is that you've written over the last little while especially uh, during the lockdown period did you find yourself more creative or it was it was the same and what it is that you're working on so a twofold question here what you've written about in the last little while did you find yourself more creative during the period of lockdown? And uh, what should we be expecting from you? 
Uh, I have found myself more creative. I mean, I've been very, you know, I, I know I'm lucky that I've been able to, able to be like that. And I know a lot of people haven't been able to during the lockdown. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that my example or what I've done is what I think everybody should be doing because I know we all deal with different you know, circumstances. But I have been luckily, happily been able to be more productive. Uh, how and why, I still haven't quite worked out yet. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I've worked steadily on a prose project since about last February. Okay. Um, so the prose project that I've been working on um, is a cycle of fantasy stories that um, take place in a shared fictional kind of continent. Uh, and it's less... They are interconnected and interrelated, um, but not sort of in a direct linear way. So it's not a it's not a necessarily a novel where one event leads to the next and a common cast of characters moves through. But each story or several stories um, deals with a different uh, fictional kingdom on this continent uh, and their interactions with each other. So events in one story might influence events in the other uh-huh. um, to to a certain degree, and there are certain common events that go through the um, series um, of stories, but it's not a linear sequence. Um, and these are more, much more fantasy. It's not um, Game of Thrones style where it's sort of European history with a little fairy tale thrown in. Uh-huh. Um, this one I would compare, if I was compare it to anything, I would compare it a little more to like Dark Crystal to a certain um, way, which is the Jim Henson um, film in the Netflix series. Okay. Um, which is more, which is more pure up in its fantasy. So, uh, you know, this, and I was also, how do I say this? When I first started writing fantasy stories, I was very influenced by having like elves, dwarves, the traditional kind of tropes. Um, but I quickly found that no matter how different my plots or ideas were, as soon as anybody saw elves and dwarves, they immediately said it's too much like Tolkien and we don't want it. Um, and then, and everybody wants, you know, European um historicism reality like game of thrones at that time yeah. um so then eventually, eventually this pushed me kind of in the opposite direction where i th- started thinking about using lesser uh known or lesser used fantasy uh, beings instead um so there's a race of like witches in uh, this one which aren't unused but um i have my own kind of spin on it um there's a race of vampires as i call them the A-M-P-Y-R-S, okay. that absorb energy that, that absorb energy rather than blood. There's beings made of rock, uh, these kind of archangel types of beings, giants, unicorns, sentient unicorns, um, a bunch like that. Uh, and so these beings and kingdoms interact with each other and the actions move around. So that's what I've been working on over the last uh, about a year. I'm just on the last piece now. So hopefully once I finish this last, this newest piece, um, then the whole thing will be done. Um, two of the pieces are narrative poems um, that you sort of tell a story in a narrative way with meter and things like that, okay. and the rest are prose. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm still, I've published a couple of fantasy stories in amateur magazines. I'm still trying to get into the um, more prestigious, uh, higher paying um, ones that are called S that are called SFWA qualifying. Okay. SFWA is the sen- is science fiction and writers, um, uh, science fiction and fantasy writers of America. Okay. And they give out, I think, one of Nebulas or the Hugos, but one of the big, big science fi awards they give out. And um, everybody is kind of part of them who's big in that sci-fi fantasy world. Um, you can't join the professional organization, though, without having a couple of sales in magazines that they've vetted and are on their roster. So, I'm, and they're very tough um, to get into. And I've tried a lot and I'm still trying to practice the craft. Um, and I'm still learning in that way. And prose I find is probably the most challenging for me because of all the moving parts that you need yeah. to keep track of in terms of pacing the story, dialogue, character, plot, um, the sound of the, you know, the voice, it's everything. Um, and so it's been very tough, but uh, we'll see. These stories don't work as well, maybe in isolation. I've tried sending some out, but uh, sometimes I get back a rejection with a question. Oh, I don't understand this part, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's answered in another another connected story. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to probably treat, I'm gonna have to probably treat it as a um, full book manuscript, which has the proper length to meet that. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's mainly what I've been working on. I've also been working on a few poems and trying to memorize more poems and also keep 
practicing my memorized kind of spoken word poetry stuff so I don't forget, you know, in the absence or in the um, decrease of live events. Um, so the plan is hopefully that once the book that I had shared with you yeah. uh, comes out with the small press, uh, Mosaic Press in Moakville, once that one gets um, put out, I'm hoping that it puts me in a strong enough position that I can take the manuscript that I'm about to finish soon and once I've revised it, um, a strong enough position that I can have some standing to send it to other publishers or to an agent or to whatever, um, with hopefully that prose book published and my other, my other uh, things behind that. Um, so that's what I've been working on. Um, I usually write in the storybook, write in the notebook, retype it out, edit, move to the next story. Um, does that, does and that, I've been working... does that have a name yet? The stuff you've been working on? Uh, yeah, r right now the working, the, the, the continent on which it takes place, the fictional one is called Kathek, okay. K-A-T-H-E-K. -E okay. um, and because each of the stories kind of revolve around some kind of disaster or um, misfortune befalling the kingdoms, uh, the working title for now tends to be The Cataclysms of Kathek. Okay, okay. And uh, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. For now. <laughs> All right. No, but I want to, I just want to touch on the, uh, what goes to the heart of why you write, um, why you write in the genre that you write, if you don't mind. Uh, yep. what, what's, uh, what goes to the heart? Sure. Um, I, I, you know, when I read, I know there are big themes that you try and address, but what goes to the heart? And is there anything that you try and achieve with this very grandiose and, you know, larger than life type of, uh, you know, setting for your, for your, uh, for your projects? Uh, yeah, no, the, um, I, the reason I think is from what I, it's very much informed by what I liked to read when I started reading and what got me into reading okay. largely. Okay. Um, I was very, and I, and I think the thing that got me into reading most was the ability, um, to kind of escape into a fictional world and a very well constructed or at least, um, strongly imagined fictional world. So the first time that happened to me was, you know, reading The Hobbit as a kid, Lord of the Rings, and getting obsessed with the kind of Tolkien mythology. I also was a huge fan of the Dune uh, series when I started up okay. uh, reading, Dune, D-U-N-E, and they got a film you know, coming out soon, which will hopefully get it right. Um, and, uh, and just a bunch of fantasy series, and that's extended into video games. So I've always liked the idea of disappearing into a fictional world, and I've always admired those writers who can create a strong fictional world. Um, Jack Vance is another one who does that very, very well. Uh, Gene Wolfe did that very, very well. Ursula Le Guin. Um, all people who are like major in the science fiction SFWA uh, community. Um, but I've always liked it that way. And I've always liked the ability to address issues almost indirectly so that you can kind of get points across a little in a bit more of a subtle way in that people, when they're reading it, are looking at it kind of in a very, with a very cold lens if I wrote to write about these issues as they pertain directly into the present day um, and presented it, certain uh, elements that immediately turn off people that, uh, people reading it um, because their personal feelings about the real world would get in the way, um, or not get in the way, but would affect maybe the perspective. But with a fantasy story, you can kind of write in themes and ideas and challenge certain things um, and people read it and go, oh, it's interesting. Um, so, like, for example, I mentioned the witches in, that are in the story, and they are, um, they're, they reproduce asexually. They're not, like, they all look like women, and I use her, she, just so you kind of get what they look like. Um, but basically, at the, end of the li at the end of their life cycle, they have the choice of either just dying, or they have a choice of immolating themselves on a fire, and uh, that results in two younger witches were kind of infants being born. Interesting. Uh, and they have that choice. And about half choose to do it, half choose to not do it. Um, but there's one half that thinks like, no, you have to do it to increase our population. <laughs> the other half says, no, we can do what we want with ourselves. So that kind of right to do, you know, with your body and, and, and that comes into play. And as this conflict kind of splits their ranks. Um, so that's a, a sort of example of how how it goes. Okay. Okay. No, just again, you just, you just pick out such fascinating themes from, from, from your responses that I'm, uh, 
I'm really intrigued. Well, thank you. And I want to, I, I really want to see more of what you do. And I, I really want to see what you do become, uh, for lack of a better term, more mainstream so that people can actually appreciate the complexity yeah. and the skill um, that, that, that yeah. follows what you do. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, now, before, before I let you go, I want to talk about uh, what's, what's, what's up in the future. I know a lot of things are uncertain uh, right now, but uh, mm -hmm. what is it that we're working towards here um, in terms of your work and your projects and, and all of that? What are we supposed to be expecting? For sure. Um, well, there, uh, I'm going to be doing a reading uh, for, the, the, for the city of Mississauga online for Robbie Burns Day. I did one live last year okay. at a local museum in Mississauga. Uh, but this year I'm going to be doing um, some of my work and some Robbie Burns work um, for that day live. And I'll post about that soon. Um, I'm also going to be guest uh, hosting um, an episode in early March. I think the first Tuesday of March okay. uh, it'll be airing. I'm going to be guest hosting an episode of... Um, the Uni um, University of Toronto radio uh, program Howl. Okay. So they have a Tuesday. They have a Tuesday night kind of poetry and song uh, focused radio show that's hosted right now by Valentino Asenza, uh, and uh, his co-host stepped down recently, and he's having a series of kind of guest uh, hosts do different ones. So I'm going to be curating and recording and doing the interviews, and that'll be going airing in uh, early um, March. Uh, there's going to be another Outer Haven poetry event series using three poets from Toronto that I've worked with. Um, that'll be coming up end of January. And uh, in the more general future, uh, I'm going to be doing some work with uh, Visual Arts Mississauga. Okay. Um, because uh, Visual Arts Mississauga is looking to kind of expand into some literary stuff as well. Uh, and I had uh, organized an outdoor um, write and hike uh, workshop in the fall. And one of the attendees was uh, worked at uh, Visual Arts Mississauga, um, and I did it in their kind of neck of the woods. So um, I'll be working with them on some programming, hopefully um, later on during this pandemic and once going on once pan the pandemic ends. So those are just a few things, and um, yeah, still writing and doing that. You call them a few things, so I, 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 I <laughs> they're by no means a few things. It just harkens back to what I said when we started you are always trying to better yourself and your craft and you are always trying to give back to the community and invest yourself even more so to, yeah. to, to a lot of things literary that, that's happening. And uh, yeah, sorry, you want to say something? I was just going to say briefly, I, I think I also, I don't, I kind of don't buy into a lot of the, the artiste um, stereotype of the identity. Uh, and I, and I'm, I find I'm more inspired by athletes kind of to a certain degree as I think about my craft. Okay. I often think about it more in those terms. Like I have to sort of like if I was an athlete and the pandemic hit, I would have to keep training, mm -hmm. you know, and not lose the muscle memory or the whatever. Sure. Um, so uh, in terms of like our daily or a, a regular-ish diet of reading new stuff, writing new stuff, practicing new stuff, I, 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 I treat it maybe a little bit more like an athlete in that way, um, which is um, uh, sort of how I, how I maybe approach it, which leads to kind of maybe that um, the effect or the the the, the uh, impression that um, you're, you're mentioning, yeah. But that's part just part of how I think about it. No, but I think it has served you well, and I think it's gonna keep serving you well. Um, I am very uh, again. I've been fortunate uh, doing all of these shows to meet with a whole uh, whole bunch of really fascinating, interesting, talented, and creative people in our neck of the woods, and you're uh, you're one of those people. And not just saying that because you've come on this show, I've known you for a little while now, and I'm I'm really uh, inspired by how you keep on, like I said, bettering yourself and bettering your craft. Uh, so, on behalf of you know all the stuff that we do, um, I want to say thank you for deploying your talent in the way that you have. I think it's serving a purpose. I think it's serving, um, it's serving humanity. And uh, it, it's just really fun to talk to you, to gain a lot of insights. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, I look forward to seeing you in a different space, a different atmosphere when this all passes um, passes on. Uh, but thank you so much, Paul. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, no, thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity and everything you've done to organize and support as well with uh, the interviews you've done and the shows you've run and your own readings and performances. And uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be in, the, in your sphere of, uh, of 
uh, so uh, friends and acquaintances, and I'm 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 very grateful and uh, and I admire what uh, the persistence that you put into this as well. Awesome, man. We'll, we'll keep talking. I will follow up on all of your uh, events and stuff, and we'll try and promote you as best as we can on our on our page. But uh, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, we'll keep talking, sir. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No problem. Take care now.